Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Minnesota Housing's information session on the Workforce Housing Development Program. My name is Katie Moore and I am the program manager. Today's webinar will go over some important details of the program to keep in mind as you are putting together applications. Uh, and a recorded version of this presentation, as well as the slides, will be posted to our website for you to refer back to later. Some of you may already be familiar with Minnesota Housing's work. For those of you who aren't, Minnesota Housing provides access to safe, decent, and affordable housing and builds stronger communities across the state. We also support the development and preservation of affordable rental housing through both financing and long-term asset management. Additionally, we have pioneered a successful model for supportive housing that helps stabilize the lives of some of the state's most vulnerable citizens. Today's agenda includes a review of the purpose of the program and some key program features, a brief overview of how applications will be reviewed and scored, highlighting some important responsibilities of the recipients, including the importance of understanding contract obligations before requesting and committing to funds, providing an overview of the RFP timeline and demonstrating the program's webpage. And finally, we'll have some time to go over any questions that you might have. Uh, first, I wanna highlight a few other resources that Minnesota Housing has to offer. For affordable or market rate housing, Minnesota Housing is a multifamily accelerated processing lender or MAP lender. Contact Teresa Larkin for more information about MAP loans. For affordable housing developments, our low and moderate income rental loan or Lemire loan is an amortizing first mortgage. It typically has the lowest interest rate in the market for this type of financing. It can be a 40-year fixed mortgage. Tax credits and deferred loans are also available through the consolidated RFP. Contact Susan Thompson for more information about affordable housing resources. And finally, Minnesota Housing also offers a deferred loan for landlords in greater Minnesota to rehabilitate existing rental housing. Contact David Schlechter for more information on this program. Okay, uh, let's start by going over the purpose of the Workforce Housing Development Program. The goal of the Workforce Housing Development Program is to expand workforce housing in greater Minnesota communities that can demonstrate job growth and demand for workforce rental housing. Funds are available as grants or for forgivable deferred loans to create new market rate residential rental properties. Applicants can submit applications for mixed income projects, but a preference will be given to projects with the highest share of market rate units. Minnesota Housing has $1.9 million available for this funding round, and we expect to fund three to five projects. Future funding is subject to legislative approval in the next budget year. Keep in mind that this program is only available for communities outside of the metropolitan area. Our program guide, which can be found on the website, provides a definition for your reference. Now I want to make you aware of some, key, uh, some of the key program features to keep in mind when you are working on your application. The program guide provides a more detailed definition for your reference, but eligible applicants are generally small to mid-sized cities in greater Minnesota. Funds cannot be awarded directly to a developer and Minnesota Housing will not review applications submitted by ineligible recipients. Once awarded, applicants will enter into an agreement with the developer listed in the application to award funds to the project identified. Applicants can award funds to the developer as a grant or a deferred loan. If applicants award funds as a deferred loan, the terms must be equal to or more favorable than the terms they received from Minnesota Housing. Minnesota Housing will not be providing contract templates for applicants to use with their developers. Applicants should not request workforce housing funds in an amount greater than 25% of the total development cost of the project. Applicants must submit a project workbook that demonstrates the funds would not exceed the statutory threshold. This is an application threshold requirement and Minnesota Housing will not review applications in which requests exceed 25% of the total development cost. 
If awarded, recipients must begin construction within 12 months of signing their contract. Construction completion must occur prior to the end of the three-year contract term. <clears throat> Applicants must have a commitment of matching funds of $1 for every $2 requested. Applicants must submit a government resolution that states where the matching funds will come from. For example, a local unit of government, business, nonprofit, or a combination of these sources. Matching funds do not have to be a cash investment in the project. They can also be in-kind donations or a combination. It is important to remember that matching funds cannot come from the developer or owner or an entity affiliated with the developer or owner. Additionally, previously incurred project costs do not count towards the match. In the next section, I will discuss threshold requirements that applicants must meet in order to move to the scoring phase. Applicants must demonstrate that they meet five threshold requirements. These threshold requirements are statutory. The next few slides will go over each requirement in more detail, but essentially applicants must demonstrate that they are an eligible project area under this program, demonstrate that the rental vacancy rate in the area is at or below 5% and has been for at least the prior two year period. Additionally, applicants must also demonstrate that funds will be used for statutory qualified expenditures and that there is a required commitment of matching funds. Applicants must also demonstrate community need for the proposed project and the amount of funds requested does not exceed 25% of the total development cost. Applicants must demonstrate that they are one of three eligible project areas. So what do we mean by an eligible project area? This term is from the workforce housing statute, but essentially eligible project area and eligible applicants or recipients mean the same thing. Eligible applicants are typically small to mid-sized cities in greater Minnesota. We've posted a city list on our website that lists all of the cities in Minnesota that meet the population preference of 30,000 or fewer residents. In most cases, small and mid-sized cities can refer to the eligible city list that we have posted on our website to, to determine if they are eligible. If you are listed on the eligible city list, you do not need to worry about the other two project area options. If you are not listed on the eligible city list, you must demonstrate in your application that you meet one of the other two criteria. The application checklist has, a detail, has detailed information regarding what supporting documentation you would need to submit in those instances. If you are not listed on the eligible city list, you must demonstrate in your application that you meet one of the other two criteria. You can do so by providing a map of the project area and the population of the area or provide documentation that the area is served by a joint county city economic development authority. Applicants only need to meet one of the eligible definitions. To demonstrate that you meet the rental vacancy rate requirements, you will submit a signed certification form stating that the average rental vacancy rate has been at or below 5% for a minimum of two years. We will not be requiring a market study to support this. To meet the qualified expenditure threshold requirement, you will also certify at application that if awarded funds, those funds will result in the direct development of market rate residential rental properties. Examples of eligible uses of funds include acquisition of property, construction of improvements, and related financing costs. As discussed earlier, applicants must have a commitment of matching funds of $1 for every $2 requested. Applicants will submit a government resolution that must state where the matching funds will come from. For example, a local unit of government, business, nonprofit, or a combination. Matching funds do not have to be a cash investment in the project. They can also be in-kind donations or a combination of both. Remember, matching funds cannot come from the developer or owner, an entity affiliated with the developer or owner, and keep in mind that the previously incurred project costs do not count toward the match. 
Applicants also need to submit at least one letter from one local business that employs a minimum of 20 full-time employees. Applicants can submit more than one letter from more than one business as long as the total number of full-time employees between all businesses equals 20 or more. We have provided a template letter on our website for you to use. The letter must contain information to support the need for housing in the area. The more detail, the better. For example, an applicant from the last funding round submitted a letter from a local health care provider that was renting out units in the assisted living home in order to retain workers. The letter or letters should help to tell the story of housing issues in your community. Letters that do not include the distance from the business to the eligible project area and the number of full-time employees will not count towards satisfying this threshold requirement. Applicants who meet all of the threshold requirements will be scored using five scoring categories. For readiness to proceed, we will be looking at things like site control, zoning and approvals, and secured financing. For leverage, we will be looking at the applicant's funding request as a percentage of the total development cost. Remember, the maximum is 25% of the total development cost, but applicants with smaller requests will score better. For market characteristics, we will be looking at things like the share of the project's market rate units and the size of the project. For community size, a preference will be given to communities with fewer than 5,000 residents. When looking at feasibility, we will be looking at things like the capacity of the development team and evidence that there is a need for workforce housing in the area, including demonstrating job growth in the current rental housing supply in the area. We will also look at if the proposal, including unit mix and rents, aligns with the needs of the current workforce. Once selected for funding, applicants become recipients and agree to the terms outlined in the contract. There are a few responsibilities I want to highlight in the next slides before you begin completing your application. Draft templates of the grant and deferred loan contracts can be found on our website for your review. We encourage applicants to review the contract and familiarize themselves with the expectations if they are awarded funds. The contractual relationship is between Minnesota Housing and the city. Minnesota Housing will not be working with the developer directly. Applicants are expected to make sure their contract with the developer ensures compliance with their contract with Minnesota Housing. <clears throat> Construction timeline. As mentioned earlier, construction must start within 12 months of signing the contract and must be completed within the three-year term. Recipients will need to make sure the developer produces the amount of units outlined in the application within the construction timeline outlined in the contract. This information can be found in Section 3 of the contracts. Disbursement requests. Recipients will submit disbursement requests and supporting due diligence items to receive funds. I will talk more about the disbursement process shortly. <clears throat> Excuse me. This information can also be found in Section 4.2 of the grant contract and Section 4.3 of the deferred loan contract. Recipients will be responsible for collecting information from the developer to satisfy annual reporting requirements. At a minimum, recipients will be monitored at project closeout. Recipients are expected to keep a clean file for their award, and they need to maintain the file for the length of the records retention period outlined in the contract. This information is explained in Exhibit A in both contracts. <clears throat> Recipients are responsible for making sure the developer and all parties involved comply to all local, state, and federal laws. This includes the visitability requirements under Minnesota Statute 462A.34. This information can also be found in Exhibit A of the contract. Contracting and bidding. Recipients must competitively bid the project in, in, in accordance to the contract. Prevailing wage under Minnesota Statute 116J.871 applies to this program. The contracting, bidding, and prevailing wage requirements can be found in Section 4.4 of the grant contract and Section 4.5 of the loan contract. 
applicants should consult with their legal staff with questions and to help them determine how to comply with all laws. Next, I'll take a few minutes to talk about the disbursement process. Funds will be dispersed in three increments, an initial disbursement, a second disbursement mid-construction, and a final disbursement once construction is completed. Applicants will be able to receive up to one third of their award at each disbursement. Applicants will complete a disbursement request form for every request. Recipients must satisfy all due diligence requirements prior to receiving a disbursement of funds. Prior to receiving the initial disbursement, applicants will need to submit a commitment letter from the first mortgage lender that includes a loan closing date. So what is the application timeline for the 2018 RFP? Applications are due by 4.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on Thursday, October 11, 2018. Applicants will submit their completed applications to a secure upload tool. The link to the upload tool is listed in the application and can also be found on our website. Uh, I will show you uh, where and how to access this upload tool later in the demonstration. Applications will be reviewed, scored, and presented to a selection committee in November and taken to the December board meeting. Awards will be announced within a week of the board meeting. Okay, so now I'd like to spend some time going over the application materials and where you can access them on our website. And then after that part of the demonstration, I'll open up the presentation for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, you can just type them into the questions box on the um, on the wherever your login is uh, in the toolbar for the webinar. Um, so just type them in and I can answer those for you there. Um, so the application and materials can be found uh, at Minnesota Housing's website, mnhousing.gov. So when you get to the Minnesota Housing webpage, um, click on the Multifamily Rental Partners section over on the right-hand side of the page. And this will um, bring you to the Multifamily Landing page. And right here, you'll see Workforce Housing Deferred Loans and Grants. Uh, click that link and that will take you to the Workforce Housing page. Um, so we have information about who can apply, who eligible recipients are, uh, and then information about the 2018 RFP. Um, and if you click on this link right here, the Multifamily Secure Upload Tool, that is how you are going to submit applications once you have put them all together. And you'll submit materials to um, uh, the mhfa.app at state.mn.us. So I'm just gonna click on this real fast so you can kind of see what it looks like. So this is gonna take you to the secure login page and you're gonna scroll down here to the multifamily secure upload tool. And right here, this is where we have um, the email addresses listed for where you're gonna submit these. And this one right here, the second one down, mhfa.app is the one you're gonna use. So you'll click on the multifamily secure upload tool and that's gonna um, take you to this page where you'll click on Secure Upload. And then you're gonna enter in that email address. Uh, let's see. And then that will walk you through the upload process. So just in the subject line, make sure you're indicating that it's a workforce housing application and then put the name of the city that we keep all of the application materials together as we're receiving them. Um, so the next section on the website has all of your uh, application materials that you're gonna need. I recommend starting with the application checklist first. This checklist uh, has all of the uh, materials that we are going to need um, for a complete application. Um, it does have links right in this document here to all of the other documents that you need from our website. 
Um, and then there are some optional items, um, evidence of site control, that's not required, but it tells you what you'll need if you do wanna submit that. Um, documentation for land donations, if the city's donating land as part of their matching agreement. Um, <clears throat> and then how to document tax abatement or tax increment financing. Um, so the land donation, um, Applicants can use either the city's standard method for documenting the property evaluation, or they can get an appraisal from a licensed appraiser um, to document the, the value of the land for the match. And what we're really looking for is to make sure that, um, you know, a vacant parcel of land isn't being valued at, you know, $600,000 or something um, inflated to equal the amount of matching funds that an applicant needs for the um, match commitment. And if you're using tax abatement or tax increment financing as um, part of your matching funds, this information um, goes over what we'll need for documentation for that. And just keep in mind that the, the numbers need to be prorated to the parcel of property for the workforce housing um, application. So I would recommend starting here, reading all of this information and it's gonna be really helpful for filling out the rest of your application. Um, we also have the application narrative section. And this is where you're gonna get into information about the project, what it is, who are you gonna be serving, market information and things like that. Um, just a few notes that when we're asking um, you to describe the, um, the current uh, wages in the community and things like that. A market study isn't required, but if you are referencing a market study in your application and you're submitting that as part of your supporting documentation, please uh, in your narrative, explain the information that's in the market study and then refer to where in the market study we can find that. Um, don't just say, see the attached market study for this question. Make sure that in your narrative, you're telling a really good story and a really clear picture of what's going on in your community and why workforce housing is a need right now. Um, we're, and then there's also questions about the development team, um, the developer, the architect, the general contractor, the management company, things like that, so that we can get a, a good idea of what your development team is. So this is the bulk of the application right here is this narrative section. Um, we also have the application workbook. <clears throat> this is where um, partnering with a, a local developer becomes really important because um, they're gonna be able to help you fill out the project workbook. And it asks information about the bedroom sizes, the rent information, the operating budget, there's a mortgage calculation tab, information about the development costs, sources and uses, and then we're also gonna be looking at the cash flow to make sure that the project uh, makes sense for, from a feasibility perspective. Um, and then we also have the templates for the letter of employee support and the local government resolution. So I'll just open those up real fast so you can see those. So this has information about what we're looking for to see um, so that it, the letter meets the threshold requirements so that we'll count it. Um, and just you know, copy and paste this into the uh, letterhead of the company that you're gonna be working with. And then also the local government resolution. So some resources that you can reference while you're filling out your applications. We have the program guide. I definitely um, recommend everyone review that. Uh, the program guide is incorporated into the contract. Um, so anything in the program guide, you're agreeing to all those um, terms and conditions there. Um, we also have an FAQ. Um, and this is based on questions that we received during the last RFP. Um, so it's pretty thorough. There's a lot of really good information here. Um, there's a table of contents so you can kind of see what your topic is and see if we've already addressed that specific issue. So I recommend uh, reviewing that. 
We also have the eligible city list. And then we have um, copies of the grant and deferred loan contracts for your reference. Uh, keep in mind that these are um, subject to change at any time depending on the uh, Office of Management and Budget. So this is just the current template. That doesn't mean um, that this will be the final version, but we will update these as they change to keep everyone informed. Um, and then we also have the e-news archive um, if you want to take a look at any of the previous e-news and then uh, previous awards from our last funding round if you're interested in that as well. So that's basically uh, the bulk of what is listed on our website and how to reach the application materials. So now I um, am going to put you on a pause for a minute here so I can review some of the questions and then we'll go into the question and answer session of the webinar. All right, uh, thank you for holding. Um, we've got a couple of really good questions here, so I'm going to go over those and then I think I'll just go through some of the the big items and the FAQs that are going to be really helpful as you're going through and trying to put a proposal together. Um, so the first question is, what if the developer is a related business to the general contractor? Does the project still need to be competitively bid? Um, this is a really good question, and it's not something that I can address directly right now on the webinar. Um, that is going to have to be, our attorneys are going to have to weigh in on that. Um, we are aware that in some situations, this might be something that comes up for some of these projects. And so there are options within the grant contract on how to address those. Um, so what I will say is I will reach out to the person that asked this question directly um, and talk more about that. But if you are putting your application together, and you're in a situation where the developer is also the general contractor and you're trying to understand how that will work with those competitive bidding requirements, reach out to us um, the sooner the better so that we can work through, through those on the front end um, and make sure that we're setting you up for um, a successful project once we get to the point where we're signing the grant or deferred loan contract. Um, another question is, our city does not have a current certificate of compliance, nor have we submitted an affirmative action plan. Um, the affirmative action form on our website is basically, um, is basically just kind of like a, a generic, form that we have everybody fill out and sign for all of our developments um, when we're working on across all programs that we do in the agency. So just fill that out. There should be options within here for you to address that as needed. And if not, um, you can just reach out, me, out to me directly if you're not seeing where your community fits in on the certification form and we'll walk you through that. Uh, another question, if a grant is received by a municipality for $100,000 matched by $50,000 from the municipality itself, does prevailing wage not apply? So um, prevailing, the prevailing wage statute, um, the 116J, does apply to this program. So it's going to be up to the communities to work with their attorneys to determine you know, how, how to interpret that statute and how it does and does not apply to this particular project. Uh, Minnesota Housing is not going to be offering any guidance on how to interpret that or does this or does it not apply if we do it this way. That is going to be up to um, the developer and the city and their legal team to work together to determine how they're going to interpret that statute and how they're going to determine their project complies with it. Um, so now I'm just going to open up the FAQs and go through a couple of the big items that people asked last year um, just to highlight those. And while we're doing that, um, if you have any questions, uh, any more questions, make sure to submit them and uh, I'll try to get those answered. Um, so we kind of went over the available funding and how much is uh, available for this funding round. Uh, we talked about qualified expenditures. Um, 
and also, you know, in this FAQ is the, the prevailing wage information and the contract and bidding is also in the grant contracts that's on the website for your reference, but it's also outlined here too, so you can take a look at that. <clears throat> Um, how is the metropolitan area defined? Um, it's the area over which the Metropolitan Council has jurisdiction. So basically the seven county area, um, except these cities or these counties and cities here. So that's pretty basic information, but we did get a lot of questions last year of people who were kind of on the border, but they still were technically the metropolitan area. Um, those people are not eligible for this program. It has to be um, outside of the metropolitan area. Um, keep going through here. Oh, we got another question here. Assuming a city is awarded a grant, construction needs to start within 12 months. Is there any amendments that can be made, assuming a 2019 construction start date, but it could change to 2020, but that will not be determined until the spring of 2019? Um, that is a good question. So when we are reviewing the proposals, you know, we projects that are pretty well prepared to get a shovel in the ground, um, the sooner the better, they're going to be um, scored better during the feasibility um, scoring section. And we're gonna be looking at, you know, how how ready is this project to go? That said, um, you know, we know we can't predict for what's gonna happen next spring. Um, and so there are, we can do an amendment to a contract if necessary, if things happen and we need to push the start of that construction out further, but hopefully, you know, if we're not awarding contracts until January, hopefully we can still um, meet that 12 month time frame to get a project under construction. Um, yeah, I think we covered a lot of the information already in the webinar. Um, just got another question. Can you combine land donation from the city with a tax abatement from the city? Yes. So uh, for matching funds, you can combine land donations, um, tax abatement, TIF, in-kind um, cash investments into the property, any of these combination of things together to get you to that 50% threshold where you're um, the matching $1 for every $2 requested. Um, I will say that if you're doing in-kind donations, such as you know community is donating, um, materials or labor or something like that we do need to see some sort of invoice that shows what the actual value of those you know, materials or labor would be that they're donating to you just so that we can have an actual dollar amount um, to make sure that that form of the in-kind donation is fair across the board to everyone else who's maybe doing land or TIF or things like that so any combination of sources can be used to the, the to meet that combined um, threshold requirement. Okay, I'm uh, just gonna wait a couple more seconds here to see if anyone else uh, has any more questions. These are really good questions. Um, again, uh, Minnesota Housing, we have 1.9 million available and we're expecting to fund three to five projects. So around the three hundred to five hundred thousand dollar range um, for awards. Um, we're going to be announcing those awards after our December board meeting, <clears throat> and then we'll start working on signing contracts after that. Um, so we just got another question. So a project is planned to start in two thousand nineteen but it would be site grading, um, would that count as start of construction? Um, I would say yes, um, you know, anything, once we get that contract signed, any form of construction on that site uh, will count towards actually beginning the construction, even if it's not the actual building of the building itself, um, any form of construction work to get that project going would count. 
Um, again, um, you know, projects that want to mix um, market rates and income restricted units, that is allowed. Um, the statute does require that we give a preference in this program to projects with the, the most market rate units. Um, but if you do want to do some income restricted units, maybe another funding source that you have lined up requires 20% of the units um, to have income restrictions, definitely go ahead and submit that application anyway for this program. Um, that is a portion of the scoring, but it isn't going to make or break um, a project on its own. So we definitely want to see a different types of um, housing proposals and, you know, if if we can make it work and you score well enough in the other categories, we definitely want to see some um, mixed income projects as well, if that's what your community needs. Just looking to see if there's um, some other good questions. Um, does a school district count as a local business? Yes. Um, we had a lot of applicants last year that had um, the local school districts um, submit letters of support for the, the housing needs in their community. So yes, that is an excellent um, local business um, that would count towards the community support requirement. All right, I'm just gonna wait and see if there are a couple other questions that might come through. Otherwise, um, I think we'll end the webinar a little bit early. Um, and give you a 15, 20 minutes of your time back for the day. Um, we are going to post this recorded webinar to our website so you can go back and rewatch it if you need to. We'll also post the slides. Um, I will go through and rather than posting, you know, the questions that we received on the webinar um, with the slides, we'll actually just incorporate those into the FAQs and then um, post an updated version on the website. Um, we're trying to keep all of these um, questions in one location and kind of keep a running, a running tally on that as we're doing the program year to year. So that's where you'll see the answers to those questions. Um, and you know, if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to contact me. Um, Katie Moore, you can call me at 651-296-6354, or you can send me an email at katie.moore at state.mn.us. Um, definitely reach out to us. If you have um, a project in mind, we want to work with you sooner rather than later to kind of make sure that um, it seems like it's a good fit for the program. We want to make sure that you can meet all of the uh, contractual requirements in either the grant or the deferred loan agreement make sure that we're setting everyone up to be uh, really successful with this program. And it looks like we don't have any other questions. So I am going to, oh, here, we just got one more. Are there any restrictions on other funding coming from a state source? Uh, that's a good question. No, um, there isn't. The, the big restriction is that this program, you can only have up to 25% of the total development costs funded with the Workforce Housing Program. So um, there was a point in time where DEED was administering this program. So if you received funding under the Workforce Housing Program from DEED, um, you would need to consider that funding source when you're requesting funds with this um, program through Minnesota Housing because that total cannot um, meet the 25%, that can't exceed the 25% of the total development cost. So um, any other funding sources, there aren't any restrictions, but if you are doing a project that received a previous award um, for whatever reason, then we would need to worry about that there. And then we got another question. Um, can you include commercial space in a workforce housing project building? Um, you can include um, you can include commercial space. I think in the FAQs we talked about that. Um, you do have to in the workbook. You're going to have to prorate it so that the award is going directly towards the units and not the actual commercial space in the building, but it is possible to do a mixed use project. Um, 
just making sure that, you know, when you're talking about the total development cost, it's going to be based on the, um, the rental units of that building and not the commercial space because this program isn't for commercial use. Looks like they, uh, we have some really good questions that keep trickling in, so I'll wait a few more seconds here to make sure everybody gets an opportunity uh, to ask any questions they might have. All right, uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions coming in, so I will um, sign off and let everyone go for the day. Again, uh, any questions or um, anything that you need, just give me a call or send me an email, and I'll be glad to help you out. Uh, thanks for attending, and we will um, post this hopefully by the end of the week so that you guys can reference that this webinar later. Thank you.